students signed up right now anywhere from like toddler up to high school. Um, it's getting to be a lot for just the three of us, so we kind of um, got some other partners coming in. So we've got Hallsville Baptist, Lewisport Baptist, and Union Baptist are um, really helping support a main part of the toy items that we are collecting. What we do, we set up a Christmas store and the parents get to come in and shop for their child with points that they earn. So um, we're just asking some of our churches, you know, uh, other ch churches to just kind of partner with us and helping them get some extra of those items to set out in the store. So that's what this flyer is. Um, if you would like to participate, I'm going to work on getting some index cards with a little bit more specific items. They might be kind of more just like a football, so not super specific, but um, you can just take an index card and shop for that item, and then I'll have a box set out, and you can set it in there. But we're asking that they um, just be turned back here before or by December 1st, I think. Yes, December 1st, because they'll be uh, doing a shopping store that Monday. I think it's, yeah, the second. Um, we're also doing gift cards as well. Just the older ones are a little bit harder to shop for. <laughs> We can, we can do that, too. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I have my contact information on there for at work if you want to contact me uh, if you have questions. But anything is greatly appreciated. It has to be new items. Um, so, but, yeah, we can. Would you rather have donations or the actual item? I mean, I, if we got an idea of what you need the most of, we could probably. Yeah, either is fine. It does help. Um, so definitely uh, grab one of those if you see one out there. I think she's, we're going to have a couple more of those. Um, we'll post that also on the band app. I also believe when she um, first reached out to me about it, uh, there will probably even be a chance to volunteer at that store um, on that Monday. So if it ends up being that you also have some free time as we get closer, I know those details get ironed out of what, who, who could help, what volunteering looks like. I'll make sure we get that out to you also. If that's the, one of the ways you want to help um, serve alongside, you could just show up and just kind of help you know, be part of that time as folks are coming to do their shopping um, for Christmas. So be mindful of that. Um, and then just a little bit of an update on the uh, Christmas performance. Um, we had a chance, uh, Becky and I had to talk last week about kind of how things are coming together. Uh, we're gonna start spending some of our time with the kids um, on Sunday mornings practicing through um, the performance details. It's gonna be a really fun, sweet, um, simple performance. Um, it's going to be a couple of speaking lines for the little ones, but it'll also be, they can kind of like mouth those words. We'll have the, the audio for it as well. And then the best part, which is something that we talked about, you know, sometimes these performances, um, they have these songs made for them. And so the kids know them. And maybe if you're a parent and you've got the CD, if we still do those, um, you have to hear it played in the car constantly because you had to have your kids memorize it. Um, but all the songs are going to be um, Advent and Christmas um, hymns. So we're going to all know those. So there's going to be a, a good buy-in um, come that night of Sunday, December 22nd, uh, that when those songs go up, uh, we as a whole body can sing along with those. So that'd be a great opportunity for us. There's going to be a dinner uh, we're going to have beforehand. Uh, we're going to do like a potluck for sides and desserts. Uh, the church is going to come together. We're going to take care of providing like the main entree and meat option. Um, it's, it's exciting times, guys. These are the, the things you kind of look forward to uh, the holidays, and this is one of those opportunities. So we'll get some more information out there um, as, as that comes together. Um, but just know that those are things that are moving. The wheels are in motion on that. Um, we'll have some needs for some volunteers along the way. Um, I'll let Becky and Laura help guide us um, as we know exactly what that will look like. But in the meantime, if you've got questions, uh, reach out to Laura or Becky or Jamie as well. So anything I missed there? Oh, yes, at the Rosenblatt building. It won't be here. We'll be just up the street at the Rosenblatt building. Uh, we did a quick tour of that on Friday. Um, it's going to be a perfect setup. It's going to be great. Anything else before we move forward to this morning? Well, let's pray together. So, Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come again knowing that you, you commune here with us, that you, you hear us and you don't just hear us, you respond. Maybe not always in the way that we would expect, maybe not always in the way that we would desire, but you are a responding God. And so, Lord God, we pray, would you 
um, speak to your children in this time? Would you move through um, our surrounding ourselves with your word and let it be part of the way that you speak here today? We ask that you be with the kids as they are receiving your word, as they are learning and growing um, and, and maturing in their faith, that we would be not just the place that they come, but they be the examples of discipleship and following after you and what that looks like, both the highs and the lows, the things to be celebrated and the things to repent of. Lord God, would we be a true example of what it is you desire your church to look like? We pray, Lord, that you'd be with the names um, and situations that are in this box that we pass around. Again, that this becomes for us a spiritual practice of carrying the burdens of life with one another. We pray, Holy Spirit, that your, um, your presence here, uh, whether it feels um, abundant or it feels thin, that it is here. That you show up no matter the circumstances. That you are where your children gather. And so we pray with uh, rejoicing in our hearts. This is for you and unto you. And as you promise in your scripture, you send it back without it being void. So we accept and receive what it is you have for us here today. We pray this all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are officially moving in uh, to a new series as far as, the, again, the kids' curriculum is moving into a series for this November. Uh, and as you can, there's a couple of the pronouns uh, for the scripture reading for each of the Sundays um, out on the offering table. Um, just so we always have a little bit of context, the series is called Special Delivery, No Postage Required. Um, and today's theme is God Gives Us Good Things. So that's what the kids are diving into, and they're going to be in the same passage as we are uh, in James chapter 1. I'm expanding out what their passage is, so if you're following along, we're going to read more than that today. Um, but the irony is, as just a couple weeks ago, we found ourselves in James uh, by means of another passage uh, in Proverbs, and so the irony is we picked up right where this passage today ends off. So it's interesting that in just the last three weeks, we're in the book of James uh, more than once, and we happen to kind of, in this case today, we're going to bring ourselves up forward through uh, James 1.18, which is where we picked up with James 1.19 two weeks ago as we interacted with the book of Proverbs. So um, in light of that, if you'll follow along, I've got this, um, again, I re I'm reading from the NRSV this morning. Uh, this will be James 1, 1 through 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Our brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 8. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. However, let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up, and the rich in being brought low, because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the field, its flower falls and the beauty perishes. It is the same way with the rich in the midst of a busy life. They will wither away. Verse 12. Lest is anyone who endures temptation... Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, would say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one who is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it, then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Verse 17. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. All right, so I happened to mention when we talk, talked a couple weeks ago that the reason why James seems pertinent when looking at Proverbs is that there is a, a really a very true um, look at James from a New Testament perspective as being the most proverb-like book in all of the New Testament. 
I said all those things, and then we read a very short passage from James 1, 119 through about 20, and it was probably the least like that. But having now just heard 1 through 17, you see about every three verses, he kind of is attacking another kind of proverbial way of speaking about the faith and life in Jesus. And so in light of those things, um, I, I would love to just do this. I want to make sure we, we don't miss today. But what are some reflections? What are some things that maybe jumped off the page to you? Maybe some things that you heard? Anything that just seemed pertinent to share with the rest of the group this morning? All right. Not a problem. Let's move on. Let's move forward. Um, so here's something that I found to be really interesting. So um, New Testament uh, scholar N.T. Wright, uh, he's Anglican, for those who uh, might have heard the name. He also is his Christopher Wright is his other name. I mean, it's his first name. Um, but he happens to say this about this particular passage. He says, for those who follow Jesus, the Messiah, they are not simply supposed to survive. They are supposed to count, to make a difference in the world. And this is my favorite part. Whether through the quiet daily witness of a faithful and gentle life, or if by chance given to some, to speak and act in a way that reveals the gospel to many others. For all, of, for all of that we need to become strong, we need to face such challenges. I love that when he says this, right? We, he, he's kind of saying there will be those whose uh, responsibility is to share the gospel with many and in multiple facets, in different scenarios, all across their lifespan. And then there will also be a call to the rest of us, to reminder that our simple, gentle lives are as equally as important to share the gospel in. And then in the midst of this passage where there is this uh, taking joy in your, um, in your struggles, or taking joy so much, uh, not so much in struggles, um, but in this uh, this reminder that you might face trials, that you might have to figure out how to work through difficult times, that in this for each of us is a chance for the gospel to be shared. Not just for others, but to hear it spoken again to ourselves. To hear the good news of Jesus, not just once, um, but many times in a day, sometimes. Sometimes in and through difficult times. Um, and yet I think the gift of Jesus that uh, we could tag on to what Wright has to say about this particular passage is like the gift of, this, uh, of the cross, is it's not just for those of us who already believe, but it's also for those yet to believe that one day they too will hear this reson resonance in their hearts, that you count, that your life matters to the God of the universe. And that I think at times is, is one of those things that we move past in our faith, not move past, that's not fair, um, that we acknowledge is there, we have heard it once, and it has it's kind of established itself as foundational to our walk with Jesus. But oh, to forget what it meant to hear it the first time, to have said out loud the first time, I count to the God of the universe. You know, there are times when like singing a song like today, um, for I'm a child of God, I, I will sometimes in prayer and worship will say, Lord God, remind me that there are those who have not sung this song yet. There are those who the, the I in this is not me anymore, it's someone else. Who is it, Lord, today that I should be praying will one day say, for I am a child of God, who they have not said those words yet. And so we have this, this laying out of the reality that James, who is, um, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, uh, most likely this is in reference to James, the brother of Jesus, which we have talked about in the book of Acts this summer, has a really important role in leading the church in Jerusalem um, in the wake of, uh, of the crucifixion and the resurrection and the church coming together. Uh, James the Just, as he is sometimes called in history, um, a man who loved his prayers. In fact, it is said it kind of within a, a myth about him, whether true or not, we don't know, uh, but that he prayed so often uh, that when he was found having passed away, he had gone off to pray. And when the disciples came to him, uh, they found him having gone to be with the Father, but what he had done was go in prayer. Quite literally, he went in prayer. And so this is a guy who, when he writes the things in James, I would actually encourage you, um, read through the book of James knowing that this, what we know about this individual in history is his commitment to being with the Father through prayer. Knowing and believing, um, as, as Paul said, if you recall in the book of Acts, we get a, a, a small biography of James. 
later on in the book of Acts, Paul says, oh, Jesus also, the risen Jesus also came to his brother James. And that's why we, would, we piece together, that's mostly why he's leading the church in Jerusalem. And so in light of that, read through the book of James and, um, and see how he speaks, what he says, and know how committed he was to prayer. Because you would read through this book and you would be so challenged by action or inaction, by certain ways that we do things and don't do things, and to be thinking about all this as a person who prays all these things. Because I think there's oftentimes a, a split we do. Well, there's people who kind of pray quietly, and there's these really active people in their faith. And it's, it's one or the other. Read through James, knowing his commitment and love for prayer, and see the culmination of the two of these things coming together. It's just, I think, it would be a fun practice for you. Uh, but I want to pause here as we look at this particular word. Again, I read from the NRSV, uh, my brothers and sisters, beginning in verse 2, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect. What is so interesting is that this word in the Greek has two primary translations. The word for endurance also can be translated and is in many other translations the word patience. Does anyone else have the word patience or have heard patience in this light? Okay, you had one. Thank you, Randy. Here's what's interesting. Word study, fun thing that you do sometimes, uh, that I do, <laughs> fun things that I do. Um, word studies, just take a moment. Think about the word endurance and think about the word patience. Do you, in your day-to-day -day life, would you use those words synonymously? Would you say, in a situation where I would be saying, here's a time when I would use the word endurance, are you talking about patience? When you're sometimes thinking about teaching or speaking on patience, maybe to a little one or a friend, do you think about endurance? Because we could step back and say, well, they're very similar, but the context to which you might use the word endurance versus patience would probably look very, very different. In fact, I hear endurance, and I think things like, um, you know, I think like physical activity. I think about exertion of energy. When I hear endurance, I even maybe think about, you know, uh, an item having the ability to endure things. When I think patience, I don't necessarily think about physical activity or exertion of energy. But for us to read this, again, with that word patience, I think it rings a bit different because you know that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. That reads very different to me. If I'm just reading this, maybe I'm not as I'm in, empowered by the word patience, but I'm taught something new about it. That in the midst of trial and tribulation, that there is to be a joy that is, is, is born inside of me as one who follows after Jesus, that sounds really encouraging and powerful and, and really kind of gung-ho to say, to, to grow in endurance. But if I'm also being matured into Jesus and the way of Jesus because of growth in patience, that's different. That feels very different. And this... Um, you know, it sounds interesting because of a passage that we t also tend to, to link to um, maybe this idea of endurance. We, we might think about Paul as he talked about running the race, um, right? He kind of talked about a marathon, not a sprint, if you, you know, kind of heard that all played out before. And yet also, um, there's, a, there's a realization that there's something about perseverance in all of this, right? It, it kind of is the same word, endurance, perseverance. Patience, again, I think comes differently to us in the English. But, but consider this in Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the sake of the joy that we have set before him enduring the cross disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So this word perseverance in the book of Hebrews is quite literally the same word translated endurance or patience in James 1. Similar, but here's the unique thing about Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 comes right after Hebrews 11, which we tend to call like the hall of heroes of the faith. 
where the, the author of the book of Hebrews, will, he, he lays out basically from, from, um, from Adam to Moses, and he lists out all these great members of the Jewish faith. And then he, he concludes a section, he says, I could continue, and he lists a bunch of other folks. He talked about David and Saul, he just puts them in a list. He says, I don't have time to tell you about all of their great faith. And then he goes on, he goes, there were still, there were others unnamed. It says there are others. This is to say there are unnamed people of the faith. And what he does is he gets to the certain point where he says, but for none of them they received the promise. Because he's making a very clarative historical statement. Yet Jesus had not come yet. So for all of those of the faith, there was something that they still missed because they hadn't received Jesus yet. And here's the thing, if you're looking at the book of Hebrews, if you see how 11 ends, it doesn't really ever stop. In fact, there's this word, and I, I like to poke fun at those who go to seminary, um, myself included. Um, we have this really nerdy set of things that we will do sometimes. Um, for example, like a professor who stands up in chapel and says, and then there's a therefore, and then you're supposed to t tell yourself, what's it there for. It's just super cheesy, stupid stuff that we do, and people are like, ha, 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 look how funny we are, um, and we're all like, gosh, this is bad. Look, guys, we're real cheesy here. Um, but verse 12, uh, verse 1 of chapter 12 starts with a therefore, meaning it is not tied to everything after it. It is tied to everything directly before it. So here are this hall of heroes. Here are all these people who persevered, who endured the faith, but yet lacked the promise, who had patience in their lives, but didn't have the promise, and therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. This is basically saying there's no difference between those heroes and every person in the world following Jesus now. The difference is Jesus. Your story and their story, no matter how impactful or how great it looks and sounds and might seem to us coming as like some sort of uh, uh, vision to, to live life after, he says, and yet run the same race set before you. Do so patiently, enduring the difficult things ahead. Because the difference is not your story versus theirs and how grand we've made it. The difference is Jesus. Their story might be grand, but they lacked Jesus. Our stories all lack Jesus until they don't. And so I, I bring that up to say that this is James kind of clinging to this idea that we are following after the one that has made everything different. And so therefore, in trial and tribulation, in perseverance and in endurance and in patience, we seek joy where there seems to be none. We seek to grow in wisdom joy and wisdom coming together here in, in the first passage and the second passage, beginning here in verse 5, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives it to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. Going on, but ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter being double-minded and unstable in every way must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And here, again, this is one of those things where, again, if you just take that passage out, kind of proverbial, like a proverb for us, and yet it's not to be misconstrued. This is not the person who um, struggles with anxiety or struggles with making decisions. Right? This is a doubter here, someone who is leaning toward Jesus and keeping a foot outside of Jesus. Right? This is a person who says, I like what I'm seeing, but I don't know that I trust it. And his push to them is to say, there is no moving in maturity and, and, and growing in joy, as he says in the first section, if you are leaving a foot away from Jesus. This is the reason why the doubt and double-mindedness is, is coming forth. It's not just to say it's about intelligence or it's about information that you have and you harness. It's about what you're giving yourself to. The doubter here is the person who says, I really want to go, but I don't want to go. <laughs> I want to follow, but I don't like to get what comes with following Jesus. They want to say they want to surrender, but they really just want to like negotiate. And this is, this is something that, again, is the exact opposite of enduring difficult things. You want the good, you want the joy without the risk of hurt. And James is saying, there's nothing here for you then. And I love that he says it this way, right? That they must not expect to receive anything from the Lord to say, 
his way, receiving Jesus, is to do both. To grow in joy, but to expect hardships. You don't get both. So therefore, you don't receive anything from the Lord because you have, in essence, not made yourself available to receive from him. And for all of this to kind of come together in this idea about what this looks like when coming back to that lens of patience on this whole passage, on this pursuit of Jesus thing, right? Because we have this saying that you have probably heard it, said it. There's always a different variation depending on where you came from and who said it to you. Uh, but a, 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 a phrase uh, that you might know is something like, don't pray for patience because if you do, God will give you what you need to grow in patience. Yeah, I see some nods. I hear it. I, we know. We know this one, right? In fact, I remember the first time I heard this, and I remember thinking like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? That felt kind of harsh. <laughs> and what's wild is James, we, we don't know much, right? Here, here's what we know. Here's what we know. Patience and endurance for us, um, in the light of a don't pray for it because you might get it, it's, um, that is instant gratification, that's you saying, I went out of this so quickly that I, I'm not going to pray for patience. I don't want to grow in patience because I, I want this to be over with. That's instant gratification. That's the thing that, that these are becoming such a problem for. Instant gratification. They're, quite literally, the idea that we would just focus on the endurance and the perseverance of that physical exertion portion and neglect a growth and slow patience is to say, Give us more of what's happening here and less of what's happening here. Because this takes time. This takes trial and tribulation and hardship. That same phrase, it, um, it resonates a bit of, of, of twisting what James is saying. It's the opposite. James is saying the opposite of don't ask for patience because you'll get it. James is saying when you ask for it, know that you need it. There is joy yet to uh, awaiting you when you ask for it and when you give in to the Lord saying, I have patience more for you to gain. Does he understand that we might need a break? Absolutely. Does he understand that we're at breaking points? If there's anyone who does, it's, it's the Lord. And yet still he's saying, please do not skirt this moment. Do not rush this moment. Do not try to take yourself outside of it and let it blow by you. Will you... Walk with me through it. Because I want to teach you something more about myself as you grow in patience. As you grow, yes, in endurance and perseverance, but as you learn to look yourself in the mirror and say, I can be more patient today with myself, with those that I care about, with my own walk, uh, faith journey. That yes, there's endurance here, but there is a growth in something deeper. In me, that I might ask for patience because I'm willing and ready to find out what it takes to get patience. Because my heavenly Father is here with me through it all. He goes even further, and he he makes this kind of um, diversion, right? Another diversion. He, he makes this, uh, this these two these two ideas come together. He he says it's it's faith and endurance and it's patience and it's wisdom. And then he says in verse nine, let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up and the rich in being brought low because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field. James is basically taking Isaiah's words and just shifting them a little bit. Isaiah is the one who says it is, it is like the, the plant that rises up and it's just scorched in the heat. This is how Jesus teaches on the seeds. He's pulling from Isaiah 40. And here, too, he, James is pulling from that same teaching and saying this is not about, um, again, it is very much a twofold thing here, right? This is about kind of the, um, the hyperbole of being rich and having little and having a lot. It's also about physically having some things and, having, and not having some things. There's a little bit of both going on here. He goes on, he goes, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and it withers the field. Its flowers fall and its beauty perishes. It's the same way with the rich in the midst of a busy life. They will wither away. See how James gets to the point? He's not just saying it's about what you have and what you don't have, but there's something that comes with what you have. He calls it a busy life. The cramming in of more and more to try and keep maintaining and garnering more and more. This is the thing about life in the shadow of the cross in the empty tomb. One of my favorite stories in all of the, uh, the Gospels um, is a, um, a 
defeated father of Roman and uh, citizenship, military background, who sees his daughter dying and gives up all of his desire to maintain his status to run after a Jewish rabbi. And in the midst of running, you might know this man by the name of Jarius. He runs and he finds him and he proclaims, would you come heal my daughter? I know you can do this. In the midst of that, Jesus pauses because he feels healing power leave him because a woman touches his him. And what I love about the story is Jarius comes and he has to hit his knees before Jesus. Jesus pauses for the one who is an unnamed woman and he calls her, he gives her a name and he calls her daughter. Jarius gives up of all his status. She garners the most significant status she's ever received. It's to be called daughter by the creator of the universe. And in the midst of that, you quite literally have an example being played out. You have the person who has a lot, if you will, in life. He has to give it up to meet Jesus in this way. The one who has nothing surrenders even less of her dignity just to touch the hem of his garment. And here's the thing about these two stories and the thing about what James is saying. It isn't a comparison between what you have and what you don't have. This is not about the rich and the poor. This is, again, about the one who makes all the difference. When you're in the foot of the cross, you aren't caring about who you're, who's there with you. You're worried about your being in the foot of the cross. When you acknowledge there's life in an empty tomb, it's because you are there with those who proclaim it as well. The lens shifts from what we do or do not bring with us to the fact that there here is an example of the surrender given unto us. The perspective moves to the cross and the empty tomb and away from ourselves. So when James says that there are those who ought to be joyful for what they don't have and be prepared if you have some to give it up or to wrestle through that process, paraphrasing this little passage, he is saying because when you get into the presence of Jesus, it will not matter. You will now have a brother or, or um, sister in the faith, and it's that lens through which you know one another. It's not what you have given up. It is not what you have been given. It is the fact that it is in the presence of Jesus that you stand. So he moves through this, and he moves forward in verse 12. Blesses anyone who endures temptation. He's kind of restating what he says at the beginning in chapter two, verse 2. He says, such is the one who stood the test and will receive the crown of life. The Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and himself tempts no one. Can we, like, just sit with this one for a minute? I think we've gotten this one really wrong in the church. Let it be known that if there's any <laughs> person in your life um, who would like to make sure that you know that some folks are double-minded, it's a sibling of somebody. I love them to death, but you know, James speaking on behalf of his brother, Jesus, in the, his lordship, <laughs> is saying about the Heavenly Father, he is not one tempted. He does not play with evil. He does not give evil to you. He does not tempt you. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Um, there's this uh, realization that um, these terms uh, can get swip swapped around. The, the idea of tempted and testing here can kind of get flip-flopped. And it might read like this. Um, I am being tested by God, but God does not test and earlier in the passage here, it says, blesses anyone who endures temptation. It says anyone who endures a test. Those things, those words can get swapped. You might even have a translation that reads differently. Again, I ask, can we, in a quick passing, say temptation and testing are very similar? Without a doubt, we can. But note how different it sounds to say that Jesus, or that God would not test you. He also does not tempt you. This is where we get this one confused. We kind of say, well, you know, God had to put me through a lot. And I love what James says, my God, God did not do those things. You took part in those things. The enemy has taken part in those things, but God, God has not. We, we, you know, people will do this and they'll, they'll kind of misconstrue Job. Well, all God did is not intervene. What God did in Job's story is he just chose not to intervene. Because that's what he tells Satan. He says, why don't you consider my servant Job? He has all faith in Job. 
God does not intervene in that story, and things happen. We know this to be true. We know this in our own lives. But for us to literally have here written, God does not toil in evil. He does not tempt. He does not test. Those are the things of the enemy. And yet somehow, it's like we have gotten in our, our American Christianity that, that you should expect God to test and tempt you at some point. We're getting that wrong when we say those things, when we believe that. Will there be trials and tribulations without a doubt? Will God intervene in them in such a way that it's like, well, he's fixing the trial temptation? Sometimes, yes. Other times, no. But he does not toil in evil. But the one who's tempted by his own desire, being lured and enticed by it, then when the desire was conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. What's so interesting is in the very next passage that we wrap up in today, verse 17, every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Verse 18, in fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth, birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He is putting these two passages up against one another. The sin within us conceives more sin, and such conceived sin burns, uh, births death. Your God does not do that. Our God does not do that. Evil does that. Our God, in fulfillment of his own purpose, he says, has given us a birth by the word of truth, so that we become the first fruits of his creatures. That is to say, when you are getting it twisted, God has an answer to the twistedness that we've made of it, and that's to say, I gave you the truth. As we know from John 1, we have the logos, the logos, the word of God made flesh. Jesus is the spoken word of God. That truth is what God gives. He doesn't give test in trial and evil, for that is not who he is. And I love that there's, a, there's another way that this, this could read... Um, a different chance. It says, blessed is anyone who endures temptation or remains steadfast in testing because when they proven to be genuine, so here's this again, blessed is anyone who endures temptation, such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life. The Lord has promised those who love him. This is the, uh, another way this could read. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation, sorry, who remains steadfast when tested because they have proven to be genuine. They will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. How differently that is when we don't just get caught in these words that we really, these kind of buzzwords that, we, that kind of pull at us, testing and temptation and, and those who are um, standing the test, who remain steadfast when tested and who have been proven genuine. That reads so much different. So for us to acknowledge that, yes, there are these things that we go through, but he is saying, will you remain who I have made you to be? For yours will be the crown of life. Yours will be the joy, the wisdom, the growth in faith that he has proclaimed. As he brings this whole passage, again, kind of um, these collections of teachings, really, in a lot of ways, we, we wrestle with the how have we gotten this right and wrong? How, what do we do with this now? Where do we go with this? And I love it that, that what James says, if we pick up where we spoke on a couple weeks ago, verse 19, you must understand this then, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all the sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome the meekness, the implanted word that the power has to save your souls. He again wraps in that same idea he has used prior. He has said that these things birth, yes, but the thing within you that you has enticed sin and brought death into the world, he's saying when those things have been passed away through Jesus, we receive the meekness of the word of truth. Meekness, patience, wisdom. These things are all so different than what we tend to desire in the world. It's not what leadership and, and, and success tend to look like in the world. 
When was the last time we talked about the meekness of our leader that we want to follow? Or even their patience? Or how they exude joy in the world? This is what it looks like to follow after Jesus. To grow in the things that maybe aren't as enticing as other things that we might pursue. But to know in the light of all of them, we have been given something different. And it's in the midst of the different that Jesus has identified that we surrender. Not in how we compare to other people or compare to different situations that someone else has had, but in the midst of life that we realize it's Jesus that has made all the difference. So as we prepare for communion today, um, I, um, I, I wrestle with this still. There's a lot here that it, it, this just works against the way that t- a ton of us are wired in the world. The things that we have to kind of all constantly undo but if there is a need for prayer today over these things, I'm going to let the time of communion just come to a close, and we're going to move straight into our last song. I'm not going to prep that last song. Uh, but if you just want or desire prayer in the midst of this time that we're about to share together, I'll just be up here off to the side today um, to pray with you, to be here in any way that that would be helpful. If you also feel led to pray for somebody, just go up and pray with them. You don't have to come to me for that. But just know that what God is calling us to in the midst of this passage particularly is all the things that we see as less enticing in the world. And that's because that's what he has done time and time again. To be the difference in a way that requires us to adjust our focus. Let's pray together. And so Lord God, we come and we say, grow in us more patience. Grow in us joy and wisdom. Grow in us meekness, Jesus. That in the midst of all of these things and all of the way that we walk through life, the ways that we pursue you and and seek to know you and the ways that we're tempted to not do those things, we come and we give to you, we give them again to you uh, to be reminded It is you who has made all the difference. That our stories, they may not be documented in a holy book in the future. But for those stories that are, they're no different without your story, without your promise in the midst of it all. Give us again, Lord, eyes to see you, to know you the way that you desire us to know you. To look at the world the way that you see it we lock eyes with those in our day-to-day time to see them the way that you see. And when we start our day or end our day, when we see ourselves in the mirror, would you give us the clarity to see ourselves the way that you see us? I pray this all in your name, Jesus.